one of our clients asked us to, they, they had a TV ad and they wanted us to do uh, television for them. And we said, well, we don't do, we don't do television, but let's see what we can put together. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my friends and former colleagues, uh, came over from a company she was working at and we started a TV division and then we started a print division and things were still great now. So 29, 30 years old, thrilled, making all that, all the progress that we, we, you know, dreamed of and, um, firing on all cylinders. At that time, there were some, uh, claims that, that a couple of our advertisers were making, uh, and, uh, they could not be fully substantiated. And the FTC put some, some, uh, restrictions on them and those advertisers went away. So we went from flying high to sailing real low very quickly. Mm-hmm. And for the, you know, survival of the company at the time, I needed to make a lot of difficult decisions and let virtually everybody in the company go. Uh, my partner on the TV side, we, 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 uh, separated that business, not out of anything other than necessity. And, and she went her own way and, um, I let everybody go except for a part-time bookkeeper and a part-time assistant. Oof. So that was in the fall of, uh, 2004. And so we were, we were, you know, all of a sudden on a shoestring budget and trying to make things work and climb back out of, out of that hole. Uh, at the time, um, I had three, I'm trying to think 2004, I had three kids under three and, uh, my wife was at home and, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of stress going along with that. Hey everyone, I'm Palmer Higgins and welcome to the Big Time Small Business Podcast. I interview owners, operators, and founders of the small businesses you see every day but don't hear enough about. We talk about the obstacles they have faced, the successes they have earned, and where their business is going to inspire and inform you in your own career. On this episode, I speak with Jeff Small, founder of Strategic Media, a radio advertising company based in Maine that has a client list featuring the likes of Vistaprint, FanDuel, and eHarmony. Jeff has built the company around a core competency in traditional radio, and his company has doubled over the last five years thanks to that focus. Now, Jeff is looking out to 2025 with two goals in mind, to build expertise and business in the exponentially growing podcast sector, and to donate $1 million to local charities, a combination of which give Jeff and his team both purpose and drive. Jeff Small, founder and CEO of Strategic Media. Thanks a lot for being on the Big Time Small Business Podcast. Thanks for having me, Palmer. So uh, this one's going to be interesting because uh, of what Strategic Media does and and what you guys are getting into on the podcast side. Very, very meta, given that we're on a podcast right now. But first, just to set the stage, can you give us the the quick highlights of what Strategic Media is? Absolutely. Uh, Strategic Media is a full-service audio agency. And I've had to adopt to audio as opposed to radio in recent years. And uh, what that means is we write and produce ads for advertisers around the country. Um, more recently with podcasts, we're scripting talking points, things for podcasters to talk about that uh, will highlight the the services and the, and the products and the benefits of, of using them. And uh, then we do the media placement and strategy for our clients, finding radio stations, satellite uh, radio, uh, some streaming to some effect, working with Pandora predominantly, and uh, more recently on the podcast side, and then monitoring the performance of that media so that we can optimize their spend and and turn a profit for them. Sure. Uh, And you guys have been around for a long time, coming up on 18 years, right? It'll be 19 in May. 19 in May. All right. Uh, So that's a long time, a lot of change in the industry. Uh, So let's go back 19 years ago to the start of strategic media, what made you make that leap? What got you into it in the first place? When I first got out of school, I went to work for a company called Talk America, which was a big uh, direct marketing company here in Portland, Maine. And I 
learned about media buying at that uh, point in time and, and learned uh, about negotiations and learned about uh, about watching the performance, watching my performance real time. I would know with the media see if I made a good media buy or not. We'd see uh, the phones light up and we'd tie the profits back to the media that we purchased. Um, you know, as a 20 something straight out of school, having that immediate gratification was pretty, pretty neat. I enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, through the growth of that company, um, I saw that there was opportunity and, you know, something that I was good at. So how old are you when you started strategic media? I was, uh, 26 years old. So young, very young. Yeah. Very young. In hindsight, smart decision, not smart decision. Didn't know what you're getting into. So it was the best of times to start a company. I talk about this a lot, um, and I think youth. There's a blissful ignorance there uh, that certainly gets pegged on Chenmark as well. We're all we we were all very young when we started. We still are fairly young, um, and there's definitely a ignorance is bliss component to starting something that young. Undoubtedly, uh, you know. So all of the above to answer your question, uh, I think that you know I was I was young enough to not know any better, uh, to be brave enough to take the take the risk. I didn't have anything to lose, so to, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife was working, um, so could support, uh, the, the start of the company. And, um, you know, it, I was, I was all in and I was ready to go and do whatever I needed to do to, to make it a success. And it wasn't a problem working 16, 18 hour days because I was young and had the drive to do that and the excitement of starting something that was my own. Sure. And so was that really what it, was that really why you did it the the wanting to bet on yourself and start something on your own or was it I can do this better I see an opportunity that that for whatever reason you didn't see getting served by the 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 companies you knew existed in the space You know I I think that it's a, a mix of of all of that I uh I'd gone to work for Idex Labs after working for Talk America and I did, I was in a sales role there and had a lot of success. And, and, uh, and when that position ended and the opportunity, um, ended there, uh, I was trying to figure out what to do next and, um, tried another sales job. But, you know, my wife and, and friends had said to me, you've always talked about media buying since you left Talk America. Why don't you, why don't you do something in that space? And, you know, again, I was young. And where I was, I guess, ignorant enough to not know what I didn't know, I was also um, cocky enough and arrogant enough to think I can do this. Yep. And, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, there's a big benefit to not knowing all of the pitfalls that are ahead. And so I, I jumped into it with, with both feet, uh, confident that I could, uh, could make a go at it and do it as well as anybody. I knew that I was an excellent media buyer. And so I was ready to, to prove some people that we could do it. Sure. So I'm going to juxtapose life back then versus life now when it comes to technology and data analytics. Uh, but in order to do that, got to set the stage that, you know, back then, how, how much transparency did you have in terms of the efficacy of your radio ad? So great, you could negotiate a, a hell of a deal and you got the right time and the right spot, but how are you going to your customer, your client saying, this was a great ROI on this ad buy and we, we killed it for you uh, when you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with surveys probably in, on a huge time lag uh, and not necessarily knowing if you're driving customers to your client? That's, uh, that's a great question and interesting as, uh, as you point that out. We just had this conversation with a, with a new local client, one of our first local ones that we've had in a long time. All right. Um, Back then, everything was drive to a toll-free number. Consumers didn't have access to, or they had access, but it wasn't as widely used to going online and doing their due diligence to learn about a product or a service. So if they were interested, if we did our job in writing a, a quality ad that would elicit response, they'd pick up the phone to find out more. And we'd use unique toll-free numbers for the different radio stations. We would make sure that they didn't run within a 500-mile radius. Cell phones weren't anywhere near on the scale that they are now. And the ones that they, that we did have, or people did have and use typically were pretty concentrated to the area code of where they were calling from. Obviously that has spread out dramatically in the last 18 years, but in the first say five years of the business, everything was drive to a toll free number and we could source a lot more 
efficiently than we can now. Uh, and not, not what efficient. do you mean by that? <clears throat> Every, well, there weren't, there weren't multiple channels for a consumer to respond through. I see. So if they're responding to simpler, our ad, it was a simpler time. It was a much simpler time. And so now the attribution model is, is very layered and very complex. And there's a lot of considerations. You just mentioned the survey data. We didn't have surveys back then. We weren't working with them, but they're critical now. We didn't have Google Analytics back then. We couldn't measure lift and we, we were, weren't even really factoring that. Mm -hmm. But now we've probably got about five or six layers of attribution that we need to factor into response data. Sure. And there's still some question marks. Yep. So I definitely want to get in there, uh, especially because it's on your website that you have invested millions of dollars in the analytics side of your business. So I definitely want to get there. But first, uh, talk about the beginning the beginning of the company. Uh, before we hit the record button, you told me about a story in 04. It's a little bit of a, uh, a existential crisis for strategic media. So can you give us that story as sort of a microcosm of uh, the, the throes of small business ownership? Sure. Be happy to. Uh, so we started uh, as a radio media buying agency. And we had a few core clients and, and business was was uh, terrific. You know, I was I was thrilled with everything that we were doing. We were making headway. Uh, I think I had probably 10 employees at the time. Yes, yeah, so you're like 29, 30. You're killing it. it was, I was excited. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fun. And one of our clients asked us to, they, they had a TV ad and they wanted us to do uh, television for them. And we said, well, we don't do, we don't do television, but let's see what we can put together. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my friends and former colleagues uh, came over from a company she was working at and we started a TV division and then we started a print division and things were still great now. So 29, 30 years old, thrilled making all that, all the progress that we, we, you know, dreamed of and, um, firing on all cylinders. At that time, there were some, uh, claims that, that a couple of our advertisers were making, uh, and, uh, they could not be fully substantiated. The FTC put some, some, uh, restrictions on them and those advertisers went away. So we went from flying high to sailing real low very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, for the, you know, survival of the company at the time, I needed to make a lot of difficult decisions and let virtually everybody in the company go. Uh, my partner on the TV side, we 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 uh, separated that business not out of anything other than necessity, and and she went her own way, and um, I let everybody go except for a part time bookkeeper and a part time assistant. Oof. So that was in the fall of, uh, 2004. And so we were, we were, you know, all of a sudden on a shoestring budget and trying to make things work and climb back out of, out of that hole. Uh, at the time, um, I had three, I'm trying to think 2004, I had three kids under three and, uh, my wife was at home and, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of stress going along with that. There, yeah. There. What is it about entrepreneurs? So this is, you're, you're not the only one on the podcast has talked about starting a business and having a family at essentially the same time. Uh, my brother and sister-in-law that I work with, they have a two-year-old daughter. So we, they started Chenmark just a few years before they had their first kid. There's got, there's something, there's gotta be something about it. I don't get it. It sounds incredibly stressful. Uh, but you're not the only one. I, I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> I don't have the answer, but I, I do know that... Uh, Might as well put all the stress and all the lack of sleeping in just one short period of time. I'll go back to I didn't know any better. <laughs> Fair. I didn't know any better, but, uh, you know, they're uh, three three thriving teenagers now, so it's... <laughs> awesome. It worked out, and it's good. So but, what about what about lessons learned? So the two things that I pick up on when you talk about that, one is you're you're having such success that it sounds like maybe you fall into the trap of doing more and doing more and doing more. Mm -hmm. And when I, so when I hear you think, talk about going into TV, going into print, and then I, you, you know, you don't have to click very far on your website to say we are audio only. Absolutely. Uh, so clearly that was, that's gotta be a lesson learned there. Um, but also counterparty risk, you know, with the customers, the clients that you're bringing on. And can you talk about some of the lessons learned in that fall of 04? Of course. Uh, so, there, there, of course, were a lot of lessons learned. And the first one, first and foremost, was I got into this business. I started the business because I loved radio. I loved um, what I what I could do with it for the clients that I was that I was working for. 
And what I mean by that is I knew that I could drive profitable returns for them. And why? Because you're the best media buyer or you're the best? I believed it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I also can tell you now that, and, you know, as any, any good businessman or woman would tell you is that I learned so much from my competition and partners about how to do things better, what we're already doing well, but what we can build on, what things that, that they've found success with that, that we can mirror to our core values. And, and, um, so people that are out there doing exceptional work have made us better. Um, and, and we watch that closely to make sure that we try to stay ahead of that curve. Um, but lessons learned is focus what you're good on, good at. And, and I knew that we, we could build a business on radio and that's why we peeled back from the print and the television. Um, I was, uh, fortunate with the timing, uh, right around, um, well, it was, it was right, right before I was going home for, for a short Christmas break in 2004 when, uh, I got a call from Proactive Solutions. You know, it was four o'clock right before I was leaving, right before Christmas Eve. And, uh, a company that I'd started calling when I started, uh, started the business. Wow. Because, um, four years in the making. It was four years in the making. And, uh, you know, Proactive Solutions, Guthy Ranker, those are, are huge names in the direct response world. And, uh, and they asked us to uh, to do a test starting in January. And so what turned in, you know, was a, uh, you know, kind of a dismal fall was a really excellent Christmas present that year. Yeah. So it was like, all right, we, we got some renewed life and I'm ready to roll and, and ready to go. So, um, you know, we, we stepped up to the plate and we delivered on on what we told them we could. And uh, that was kind of a resurrection of, of the company. And, uh, you know, I've the first two wires that I had in 2005 are still with me today. And, uh, you know, part of the growth that we've had ever since. Awesome. <clears throat> so you, you've obviously had a lot of success, 19 years in business, a lot has changed in the industry. This is a good time to talk about the investments in, uh, analytics that, that you've made, uh, as I mentioned earlier, millions of dollars spent in developing analytics. And you've, you've highlighted a few times as a differentiator for you guys. So can you talk about what that's entailed and, and how your analytics are better deeper, faster, whatever the metric may be for mm -hmm. your customers. Sure. We, uh, that was the first investment we made when we started the company. Um, and, uh, we, we bought into a, a system It was called media buy manager and it was built by somebody that had spun off from that talk America company I mentioned a while ago. And it served its purpose as media buying manager. And over time, because we had so much data, in that system. So all of our buys, all of the performance, all the people that called, uh, not the, we didn't have any personal information, but the results, the performance, um, was entwined millions of records in, in here. And we realized, uh, that it was something that would need to be a lot more robust as the agency grew and we need to build on that. And so we hired, you know, uh, programmers to, to continue to build on that system and that platform, and, uh, and so over time it's, uh, it's built on a, on a database called FileMaker, mm -hmm. which really isn't, uh, old. it's old. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they continue to update it and we, we put in, you know, upgrades year after year as the system has improved its capabilities, but it's really, it wasn't built for the data that we're managing. And over the last 24 months, we've, we've converted to Tableau. So we, we have, uh, Realize that, you know, out of necessity, our clients need dashboard reporting. Our clients need to have real time access, uh, to their media and the performance of their media. And, um, and it's been, a it's been quite a challenge. It's, you know, it, it's been something that's a necessity. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to work with some smart people that, uh, that have allowed, allowed the transformation of the system to, to happen. Awesome. So I want to make sure that I don't stray too far from the business of strategic media and spending a lot of time sort of setting the stage on on the core service that you offer your customer. But uh, 19 years in business for for a small business is a very long time. Um, not, nothing, not you know, something to be very proud of and not, not nothing to diminish there. Uh, you had you had a little bit of a of a scare in 04. Mm -hmm. At this point, that's so far in your rearview mirror. Any other big uh, obstacles, successes, lessons learned between then and now? Absolutely. You know, 
being diversified is is really key. And so I know that I've harped on the fact that we're an audio agency. That is our service. That is what we focus on. But the clientele that we represent and, and that we work with is is really important. And it's a fine balance with how much, how many resources do I add? How many employees do I add? Uh, and, and that overhead is always on my mind. Sure. And making sure that I can continue to serve my staff as, as an excellent employer, a great place to work and have the resources to do that. It is, it is a balance and, and, you know, at any given time, I want to make sure that, that, you know, not only the 30 people that work for me, but you know, their, their families are sleeping well, sure. Knowing that I'm looking beyond, you know, three or six months down the window and looking at the planning for 2019, but I'm looking at 2025, where are we going to be and how, how are we going to get there and why is it important? Mm -hmm. So the, the forward thinking, I, I, I feel is something that a lot of people lose sight of that sure. aren't in my shoes or sure. aren't in a business owner's shoes and making sure that, that, uh, there's a plan in place to get where, where the company can be sustainable. Absolutely. I think, um, my perception is that I think a lot of people would like to be able to have time to see out to 2025. I think the reality is in the world of small businesses, uh, org charts are thin. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a topic that has been discussed in the podcast a lot is, you know, working on the business versus, versus working in the business. How do you fire slash replace yourself? Uh, or how do you do the things that only you can do or that there's maximal value add? Um, talked to uh, Jeff Buckwalter uh, earlier in the podcast. And he said, basically, my job is to start things and hand them off. Mm -hmm. Start and hand them off. Start and hand them off. I can't, I can't get stuck doing any one thing. So obviously, you've been successful doing that. Is that something that you've, you've done by intent? Uh, in, in giving yourself the freedom to be able to think so long term for your business? Or is that something that is that you've had to develop over time? I've had to develop over time. And, uh, you know, didn't didn't come natural. Um, I had a business partner for a number of years, I'd say 13 years. And, uh, you know, when he came on, um, he had a lot of uh, business acumen that I did not have. And, and, uh, and he taught me a lot of a lot of those skill sets. Um, so, Understanding that that I need to look further ahead, um, you know there there are a couple of couple of tough times where you know I pulled myself away from the from the day to day and things didn't go as as I anticipated and so I had to step back in and so it didn't happen the first time it didn't happen the second time but the third time we were in a position that um, you know I I could bring on people that had the skill set had the talent had the experience that that I needed. Um, and a few of them, I mentioned a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, two people that started with me in 2005 are still with the company and I lean on them heavily for a lot of the day to day needs of the company. Mm -hmm. And so having, having such talent, uh, working under the roof, um, has given me, given me that flexibility to look a little bit further and, and challenge them when, when there are things that, uh, I think that they're getting a little bit more narrow focused on, which doesn't happen very often because they've learned it as well. Sure. So let's go there then. Uh, you have the luxury of being able to look out fairly long term. Uh, 2025 is a long time from now. So so what do you see for the business? What do you see for strategic media? It's uh it's it's not a it's not a clear vision. It's one that um, you know, it's built on on what we have uh, you know, what we've done to date. Understanding what's going to happen in the podcast space is is really an unknown. And it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out. How how so, new is that for you? The podcast space, uh, twelve months. I mean, we were really last year. It was this time. It was actually December of last year when we when we placed our first ad in a podcast, um, and uh, we were given that opportunity through doing some decent buys on the terrestrial side. And they said, "Can you do the podcast for us as well?" So of course we said yes. And uh, but you know, with the next understanding that we were new to it, mm -hmm. and so we've built on that. So what I would see, you know, in 2025, I, th I think that um, if it, if some of the current trends continue on the terrestrial side of the business, um, I expect the growth that we have seen, you know, I was looking, uh, I was the looking current early. trends being what? There's a lot of consolidation of the, of the radio groups. And so where we used to work with station to station around the country individually, we're working with radio groups as a whole 
and they're managing more, you know, hundreds of, of local buys at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, Does I make it harder to negotiate with them because they're bigger. Does that flip the script on your, your power in, at the negotiating table? Uh, I was worried that it would, it doesn't, um, f- too much. There is a radio group that, uh, that has pretty much put a, put up a wall between us and, and their radio stations, which is frustrating and challenging. Um, doesn't mean that we won't figure it out. Uh, I do think that as our agency works with more brand centric clients, that there's going to be more opportunity to work with them. And, you know, it's not 100% the, the, um, front end metric that we're measuring. We're looking at some of the brand recognition as well. And, and that's key. Uh, so I, I do expect there will be exposure there, but, um, what, what I expect with the current trends of that consolidation is that we'll, we'll, we're in such a position that we have a pretty good understanding how much media we will book year over year. And we can make some bigger commitments up front that we haven't done in the past. What I need to be careful with them. One of the things going back to what makes us different is we don't, we don't own inventory. We don't own it and then parcel it out to our clients. We build plans based on the need of each client based on the performance week over week or month over month at the most. So that makes us unique in that there's a lot of, it's a lot of heavy lifting on very short notice. Sure. But we, you know, we've put the the team in place to do that because we know our clients will get better performance and they're, they're not being uh, put in certain places that, that don't necessarily make perfect sense for them. The terrestrial side, I, I anticipate that we're going to be purchasing a lot more based on what our clients needs are year over year. And we can plan on that because the clients that we're representing are, are um, have been along with us for years now. And so we can make that commitment with their understanding that we are doing that on their behalf. Um, and so we'll own millions of inventory, millions of dollars of inventory going into each coming year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I expect that we'll probably see a modest five to 10% growth year over year in the terrestrial space. On the podcast side, the growth and the opportunity there is huge. Um, there are, I think it was 400 million in, in 2017. They're projecting tw- uh, 680 million in advertising in 2018. It's dollars. Dollars. Yep. Um, and uh, by 2020, I saw 1.6 million just uh, last week when I billion? was billion, 1.6 yep. billion dollars in, in the next two years. Right. You know, so that's what, you know, 300% growth over where it is right now. Sure. Which is, astounding it's amazing yep. uh and that's going to come into that's going to be a similar sort of model because what's happening is advertisers or agencies are coming in and buying the inventory because advertise um, podcasts might have one or two ads in the middle of their mm-hmm. in the middle of their podcast not the big time small business podcast though no. <laughs> not yet not yet they're looking for that sponsor <laughs> no i'm just kidding so uh so what that means is that their blo- people are blocking out their competition or anybody else for that matter from getting that prime prime space mm-hmm. or that prime influencer to talk about their product. And so it'll be interesting to see how that grows. I expect as, uh, as we've seen some radio groups buying small podcast, uh, not even just small, but, uh, podcast groups that they're going to deploy some of their processes into the podcast world. And which, you'll, which means what? I think podcasters are going to have more than two advertisers, one or two in the middle. And, and I, I wonder what that'll do to the space. I think they're going to need to be very careful. Uh, and Pretty what I mean easy by that, to skip over ads in a podcast. That's where I was going. And we don't, want, we don't want that. You know, with one or two ads, if somebody's engaged, I think that there's a lot of value to that, to that space. Mm-hmm. But if they're skipping over, it obviously defeats the purpose. Sure. And that's been one of the great things about radio is unlike television – People aren't skipping over ads, right? They can. It's not an option. But with podcasts, of you can switch stations. You can, but you can't. You can't press the fast forward button. That's right. So is that why? Uh, our in the world of podcasts, I'd imagine it's so new and the growth is so fast uh, that it's got to still be a little bit of the wild west of people trying to figure out what's what. Is it live reads? Is it is it nascent ads? What's the ideal length of time? What's the ideal positioning? Um, and obviously, every podcast is going to be different. Um, so, you know, have, have, are there any, are there any sort of 
lessons learned or sort of rules of thumb in the podcast space, or is it still basically anyone's guess right now? Everyone's just throwing something against the wall. I think there are a lot of rules that are coming together. Uh, I went to a um, podcast. It's called Podcast Upfront uh, a couple months ago down in Philadelphia. And one of the speakers, I think, put it best when he said, we're still in the first inning. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's a lot to be learned here. And that is absolutely true. But there are a lot of uh, similarities to how people consume audio. And and it's really this is an incremental audience. It's not we're, we're not losing ears on the radio. We're gaining new new listeners from a different from a different platform. And and these are people that are very engaged with what they've downloaded and what they want to listen to. And so there's a lot more there's a lot of uh power there in in terms of that messaging that can be that can be put out. Sure. So one thing I want to pick up that you said a little while ago was talking about uh the customers that you have are so long tenure they have the visibility into their media buys, which are going to give you the confidence to to have an inventory of of millions of uh, what's the right word slots, time slots, inventory, uh, you know, just inventory, mm-hmm. just blanket inventory. So I want to again bring this back to sort of the business side of strategic media. Uh, when and you you said way in the beginning of the podcast of needing to pre buy spots is is scaling a radio advertising company very capital intensive because you're talking about buying millions of or a million of millions of inventory slots and having to pay up front i imagine a lot of capital is tied up in just being able to service your customers for the next year that is uh one of one of the challenges that we're faced with and you know getting the commitment and the sign off from clients is going to be a, a key component there so you're spending millions of dollars and i'm assuming it's millions but you're spending millions of dollars on on inventory that you're banking on and ideally contracted from customers to get over the course of a quarter or a year. Yes. That's a tough business to scale. It's going to be a, it's, it's a, it's a newer model. How do you finance that? Um, (laughs) that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of our clients will, will actually very few cases because, you know, obviously we've got, uh, we've got terms with the radio stations. Uh, but, um, we need to receive that, those funds from clients in advance of that commitment. So we'll make, well, let me step back. We'll make the commitment on behalf of our clients. Mm-hmm. And, and so that when the ads start, so let's say we get through January because radio stations will bill on a, on a broadcast month okay. or radio groups will do that. So, there is risk in that we're going to commit to dollars. We'll get the budgets from our clients in advance. They'll sign off on that approval. We'll have funds in house from them, usually, generally a week before the end of a broadcast month. So when that closes, we'll be using their money. But let's say that somebody doesn't send us the money, which could happen. Obviously, we've got contracts in place and there are, you know, coverages and considerations and liabilities that are, that we've locked in mm-hmm. but um you know it's it's happened before where that check doesn't come in and and i think i i, I know i mentioned this early the relationships and and the partnerships i've built with these radio groups my agency depends on that and there have been circumstances where we didn't get paid but the agency will you know we're not going to stiff a radio station we're not going to we're not going to put them in a position that they don't want to work with us in 2021 because somebody didn't pay it in 2020 sure. and luckily it hasn't happened uh more than twice but it has happened and uh we try to we try to mitigate those risks as much as possible so if all goes well you're not fronting cash you're not paying out the stations and then waiting for your clients to pay you no okay because that would be very difficult that'd be very especially difficult. given the asymmetry between the scale of you guys and your clients you know, that would put you in a world of hurt pretty fast. Really fast. I mean, it would put us out of business with some of the <laughs> some of the scale that our clients have. Does, a that, lot. does that scare you? Yeah, of course it does. So, I mean, there there have been uh, examples, uh, and I can think of one locally here, company that had a contract, written contract, take or pay contract. So regardless whether you use the service or not, uh, and it was with a very large company, uh, Fortune 100 company, and they stiffed them. Uh, and it was, yeah, we're breaking a contract. We know it. Have fun. Sue us. Uh, and, you know, they knew that the company was too small to actually go through suing them. They couldn't finance the suit. 
So what were they going to do? Uh, so does that scare you? When you put it in those terms, of course it does. <laughs> yeah. So it's calculated risks. Uh, yeah. You know, they're, they're, you know, I need to take uh, caution with, with uh, the steps that we take. And, and, you know, if, if I'm anticipating that uh, in probably 2020, a hundred million dollars in advertising, I'm not going to go out and risk $50 million with it just to make sure that we can secure the inventory because for 19 years, I know that we've been able to secure inventory without doing that. Mm -hmm. But there is some inventory that I know we want that I know our clients will, if, if one client stiffs us, somebody else will take it. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, calculated risks on inventory that I know will be used because it's so valuable. Sure. So let's talk about how you think about growth. So, I mean, the working capital piece, as long as things are running smoothly, doesn't seem to be an issue. Uh, you've talked about uh, the employee side and how, you know, over time you needed to get the right people in place to be able to work on the business and, and think super long term, thinking out to 2025. So where's where's the bottleneck right now? Bottleneck is with learning about the performance of different uh, podcasts and how efficient the ads will 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 run on on a different program. And the advertisers, so we've, you know, we've in the last six months gone from two podcast advertisers to 10. And right now they're all dabbling to to learn. And are you helping them pick the podcast? We are putting all the podcasts in front of them. So we, you know, we'll look at, you know, the the message and the demographics and pick out the genre of the, of the podcast and, and make those, make those uh, recommendations on their behalf. So your team is listening to just boatloads of podcasts right now. <laughs> it's a little, everyone's overwhelming. commute is just podcast, podcast central. central. You're listening to them at two times speed to get through more of them faster. That's right. Yep. Yep. I've got, uh, I've got a couple of interns and they just sit there, uh, you know, with their headphones on six, eight hours a day. I don't know how they do it. And just listening to, just podcasts. Listen to podcasts and of course, listening to our ads and pulling them out so that we can send them to the clients. Um, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a full time plus job. Sure. So, um, so the bottleneck right now is in the podcast division. Correct. Any bottlenecks in in your legacy division? The no. radio side? Uh, no, I think we we have uh, we've got a really really solid system in place, and there's there's room for growth. And uh, I I do think it's going to be more modest. In the last five years, we've more than doubled in size. Uh, from where we were in 2013, which is really fantastic and exciting. Um, put together some stretch goals over the last couple of years for, for the team and they, they delivered on them. So, um, my focus over the next couple of years is to not minimize that growth, but limit that growth and really identify where we can be even better than we are now. Why do you want to limit the growth? Uh, I want to not to say it's bad. No, I know. But um, my, my emphasis is to identify all, well, not identify, but highlight all of the things that we sit down on a quarterly basis and say, we could have done this better. All right. How would we have done this different? And, and really, you know, peel back a couple layers there and say, all right, in 2019, when this comes up again, how are we going to how are we going to sidestep that? How are we going to make sure that our clients, you know, aren't exposed to uh, a limited inventory in May? So May, for example, TV sweeps happens. Uh, you've got, you know, graduations happening. You've got Mother's Day happening. Inventory on the radio is very challenging. And as an agency that buys last minute, we're exposed to that vulnerability. And so, you know, I want to give my team the the much like I have time to step back and look at how can I, how can I do things different or better Mm -hmm. and, and put that into our planning for future years. So I think as we grow the podcast side of the business and look for growth with the agency there, it'll allow my legacy division to focus on improving some of their systems even more so. Okay. And so you talk about sort of moderate growth. You mentioned earlier in the podcast, five to 10%. Is that a level where you think is sort of steady state growth that allows your your company both to grow a little bit in order to provide opportunities for your employees, but not so not growth that's so high, so fast that it's constant change management? 
Yeah, I think that's fair. So the five to ten percent I'm seeing on the terrestrial side of the business mm -hmm. on the podcast, uh, you know, what's a million dollars this year? I expect to probably be ten plus next year Whew. In, in advertising. Yeah. So and and I think that I'm being very conservative with that number. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> So, I mean, you deal with numbers that are so big in terms of your customer ad buys. So I'm trying to quantify when you're talking about like a 10x growth rate in podcast, what does that mean for strategic media in terms of people or, I mean, I guess it's, it's a people business, right? So what does that mean in terms of people? I don't think that it's going to be, it's not going to be a 10x uh, scenario. I think sure. um, as, as I'm interviewing people about what, what's to come. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about the evolutionary nature of, of what we're doing and that what the, their job is when they start is going to be different in a month and it's going to be different in six months. Um, one of the things that I've learned from my staff that's in place on the terrestrial side of the business is limitations and barriers that, that they felt they had three or four years ago really don't represent truth. <laughs> And, and, um, you know, there's, there's challenges that people, that people I think, uh, put up with the expectation of what's normal mm -hmm. or, or what they've created as normal. And well, that's probably one of the things I enjoy most as a business owner is working with people to help them see what their potential is and see that, you know, if we streamline certain processes that, that they're really, are ways that they can accomplish a lot more. Um, we talk a lot about, about just the, you know, from my point of view, my perspective, um, uh, when you push the limits on what you thought you could do, whether, you know, in this case it's professionally that you might be exhausted at the end of the day or the end of the week, but it's a hell of a lot more rewarding than being tired at the end of the day. Cause you didn't know what to do for the last two hours. Or saying <coughs> that you had enough time to worry about what, you know, Joe in the cube next to you was doing because he wasn't working as hard as you because, you know, everybody is is really pushing the limit on what what they thought was possible um, from before. And and so people I at least the feedback I get are very feel very rewarded um, just to, with their professional growth and in a small business. Um you know, they might not have a different title than they had two years ago, but they're doing a lot of different projects, a lot of different work. And sure, he's and engaged, very engaged. Do you, would it be fair to say, or do you think about your business in sort of three discrete increments in terms of the delivery mechanism? You have podcasts, obviously the, the, the growing, uh, the growing segment of your business, internet radio, I'm going to, I'm going to assume is slightly different than terrestrial radio. Do you think about it in those three sort of different divisions? Up until this year, I've thought about it in the terrestrial and podcast divisions, just those okay. two. As Pandora and streaming has become a bigger part of what we do, um, those will be segmented off in 2019. Okay. So it will be those three buckets. And segmented off internally, just meaning different people are responsible for those different divisions or segmented in a different way internally? Uh, from, um, it'll, the streaming which will include uh, satellite and, and podcast uh, Pandora with terrestrial. I'll have the same team in place for all of that um, in terms of how it's tracked and, and measured and monitored on behalf of our clients. They'll be in two separate Perfectly. distinct buckets. Okay. So then yeah. the question is three distinct, three distinct buckets, or at least in 2019, uh, if you had to focus on one and only one, which would it be and why? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. Would it, would it be the threshold, which is what got you started and what paid the bills for a decade? Or would it be the new hotness podcast? Or would it be the, the in-between on the streaming side? It wouldn't be the in-between. Okay. That's a really good question. I think um, if I had to pick one to go forward for the next five years with? Ten years. Ten years. Yeah. Got to think longer term than five. You're already, you're talking about thinking seven years out to 2025. I know. So I'm going to round up. I, that, that's, uh, all right. You threw me a curveball. I would probably, I would probably um, keep the emphasis on terrestrial if I had, if I was forced to make a decision. Safer? Uh, to some degree safer. I, I believe in, in radio to its core. Mm -hmm. in the and the delivery of of 
of information to the consumer, whether it's music, it's talk, news, sports. I, I think that there's an engagement you're not going to get in a lot of different places. I do understand there's a generation that's coming up that is not as tied to that. And they have. That's why I wanted to go 10 years. Okay. And, you know, their buying power is going to be <clears throat> substantial in 10 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And what about the generation behind them? So I, I know that that is, uh, that's a, a big, a big factor. Uh, that so would need to be considered, but I, I also, I, I, I don't think it's going away. Um, right. So there it is. So you're less worried about the 10 year decline of terrestrial radio, uh, than you are about just the still undefined arrow pointing up, but so much still yet to be determined on the podcast side. That's fair. Yes. Okay. So I want to wrap up the podcast with uh, a couple questions that I ask everyone. I purposely didn't ask you these ahead of time, so I would get the unvarnished All right. unvarnished answer. Uh, so the first one, maybe a little indicative of what we were just talking about. Imagine you had four months where you didn't have any of the day-to-day -day of strategic media taking up your time. Couldn't take a vacation, but you had to allocate that time somehow strategic media related. How do you allocate it? All right, so I'm not involved in the day-to-day. -day. Oh. I got four months, but I'm and I'm not on vacation. Not on vacation. Not on vacation. Hmm. I uh, I think that with that time, I would um, and, and maybe I'm going down the wrong road here. But if I could get un, under under the hood with all of the the job descriptions and day to day of of each member of the team. Uh, I, I think that I would, I would try to understand what, what they're doing 40 hours a week from the standpoint of, of what the need is for their, you know, roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I, I still, even though I know people are busy, think that there's a lot of, of mismanagement of, of time just because they're moving in too many directions mm -hmm. and, and trying to learn how to be efficient with the time you're allocated with is, is challenging, especially as priorities change. Sure. So if I could build a teaching model around how to better use your time, I think that in four months I could be confident that I'd free up two or three, you know, not specific to those people. Sure. But the time, two or the two three or three people's, people's worth, the time, worth yeah. the time. Um, so is that, is that time management or is that, is that just, uh, having people focus and not be pulled apart in so many different directions as much. I think people, maybe a little bit of both. I, I think, um, you know, as, as I, um, as we've, as we, as our company has become what it is, there, there are a lot of, um, habits that people form in terms of their work style and they get into a, a routine that feels safe, comfortable, uh, despite being fast paced and without, without having a chance to step back, they don't realize the inefficiencies and, and things that, you know, well, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'll, I'm going to step back a second. I've learned what customers need to hear versus, versus what I want them to hear. And a lot of my staff has to interact with clients. A lot of my staff has to interact with each other. And when I can hear what's going on in the office, I hear what people want to tell somebody versus what somebody needs to hear to do their job. And that I think is something that comes with, with time and maturity in a professional setting. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that if you're not given the, the space to think and, and kind of ponder how to do that, um, that, that you would never find it. Um, on the flip side, I started off talking about a lot of relationship building. And I think that they can build better relationships with maybe having more of that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly come off as, uh, you know, I mean, I tell my staff regularly that, you know, brevity is, is in my wheelhouse. You know, let's speak to the point and give me what I need to know so we can get on to the next thing. And you lose a little bit of that personal touch. Sure. So there's a balance. Sure. Uh, but I think I'd spend the time finding how to really teach people. Um, when I was done with that four months, sure. um, how to, how to better use their time and, 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 uh, and other people's time. Yeah, that's great. 
uh, and that's a new one for the podcast. So it's awesome. All right. Uh, all right. Next one. Similar allocation. Uh, this one of, of just pure capital. Million dollars falls on your doorstep. You have to reinvest it back in strategic media. How are you allocating that million dollars? I'd build on our on our technology. I'd build on our the Tableau system that we've we've put into place um, and research uh, attribution models that we can that we could deploy. Um, undoubtedly, I, I'd put it towards working with uh, you know some level of automation on on attribution of data from our clients. So our clients, uh, almost all of them, have sophisticated tracking and. They can tap into our system just like we can into theirs without uh, the physical presence of somebody doing specific work. Mm -hmm. And it allows a data exchange. And the more that we can automate there, the more we can use bright minds to, you know, distill the information as opposed to go and and actually work with the data to get it into a readable form. Sure. I'd have to imagine that the data, the analytics, especially tying into uh, your customer systems in an automated way. <clears throat> Those are all things that are going to be incredibly sticky uh, and and provide a competitive moat for you more than, you know, hey, we're really good at ad buying. Great. Someone else can come around and say, we're just as good. Mm-hmm. I can go toe to toe with Jeff and I'm just as good at buying ads. And I have the same relationships. When I think about what's sticky and what sets you apart, what drives that competitive moat, that analytics, that data piece, I come back to that every single time. It's it's significant. It makes a big, big difference. Sure. So I think it's a good allocation of capital. All right, right. last one. Very open-ended. What haven't I asked that I should have? And yes, you will have to answer that question. All right. You you alluded to the human human capital side of the of the business. Sure. Um several years ago, um one of the things that we put in place uh, for our staff uh, was um, something that, well, let me step back. Based on the success, you know, that we have on a quarterly basis, we have a profit sharing plan for our, for our staff so they can share in the success. And I needed to revamp it probably, probably about six or seven years ago. And what we did was we tied it to something that was, I felt more important. And, um, and you know what? It was six years ago because that was really when we started seeing some more significant growth in the company. Mm-hmm. And the first couple of years of that, I was able, at least I did, I wasn't able to, I chose to point to this as, as a driving force. Um, our profit sharing plan is tied to a giving back initiative. Okay. And so when, when people are asked that work for us, some of the, you know, bigger benefits thing, you know, we have all, a lot of standard benefits, but is that for, Every X amount of dollars that we advertise on behalf of our clients, we give a thousand dollars to a local charity. And so, um, I do have, you know, going to 2025, uh, you know, that number sticks out because I do have a goal by 2025 to give a million dollars to local charities. Wow. Um, and, uh, that was an 11 year stretch. So that started in 2014. I've got a ways to go. Um, but where, where are you at now? Are you just closing that? Uh, yeah, I can tell you where it about, uh, well, we will be, cause I'll do a lot here in, uh, the end of the year. Sure. Um, we'll be at about 300,000, wow. uh, through the end of this year. That's awesome. Which is really exciting. And it's something I'm really proud about. Um, it started with, uh, I mentioned my kids earlier. Um, my kids spent about a month, one of them, five weeks at the Barbara Bush hospital, um, in the NICU to start. And, and, uh, when I was able to, uh, once the company got going a little bit, we started giving back to the Barbara Bush children's hospital. And, um, then it started, you know, it, it grew from there. Uh, it went to uh main children's cancer program. It went to, um, camp sunshine. Um, my boys are involved in the main adaptive ski program. So it went to that organization, uh, and, and it's grown. And so I've asked people in, that work for me, what are, what are organizations that you're, you know, interested in? How can we help support them? What is important to you? So on and so forth. So giving back here locally, is, has been something that I probably have as much pride in as anything as it, you know, ties to the business and, and some of the things that when, when things are hard and when things, you know, and inevitably they're hard on a regular basis, but, you know, we can point to that and say, Hey, look, if we hit this metric, we're, we're going to be able to do X, Y, Z with, with this company. Mm-hmm. I really hope that we're going to be able to, to do this. You know, they look forward to it every year. How can we do more this year? And so, 
um, it kind of gives me more purpose than just saying, let's go be excellent media buyers. Let's go really be refine our process with, with the data that we're using. But why are we doing that? Why is there, why is, you know, what's the purpose behind it beyond providing a livelihood for, you know, the 30 people that work at strategic media and driving great business for, for our clients. It's a little bit more meaningful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think purpose, wherever it comes from, um, and I think having it be a uh, full spectrum, uh, and not just purpose of, I think most people want to do, to do well in what they choose to do for their career and want to feel like what they're doing is meaningful, but then having that additional purpose of great, there's this sort of social benefit to what we're doing as well. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Um, very commendable. Great thing to wrap up on Jeff small. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of the big time, small business podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review and share the show with a friend to access show notes and subscribe to our distribution list. Be sure to visit us at chenmarkcapital.com slash podcast. That's chenmark, C-H-E-N-M-A-R-K, capital.com slash podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Chen Holdco, C-H-E-N Holdco. Last but not least, we'd love to hear from you. So please drop us a line at podcast at chenmarkcapital.com. Thanks a lot.